All right. All right, guys, here we go again. Section one, three properties. So this is just a lot of stuff. So let's just get through these. Um, we're going to use these. If you remember in section one, two order of operations, I did ask you to um, show your work. And I said, once we talk about properties, I'm going to ask you what property is allowing you to actually do that. So let's talk about these. The first four um, are a good introduction. We actually use these a lot more in geometry than we do in algebra, but they're good to be aware of. And I'm going to ask you about them. So it's not like we're never going to talk about them. The most important one of these four is right here substitution. So first of all, the reflexive property, any number equals itself. Duh, right? Nine equals nine. Doesn't seem super crucial when we're talking about it in terms of algebra. It's really helpful in geometry and it's kind of one of those no-brainers. Symmetric property, if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. So algebraically, we could say if negative 7 equals x, then x equals negative 7. Sometimes that's just helpful to wrap your brain around it to be able to think about it a little bit differently. Transitive property, I like this one because this is keeping it sim simple. You've heard of that, keep it simple, stupid, this is it. If a equals b and b equals c, and A has to be equal to C. If the first is equal to the second and the second is equal to the third, then the first and the third have to be the same thing, if that makes sense to you. So how about this one? If X equals 2Y and 2Y equals 8, we could find out Y, right? But we could also say, what does X have to be equal to? X has to be 8. I think of it as eliminating the middleman. Notice, I've got equal to B and B is equal to C. I can eliminate those and I can say that A and C are equal. So transitive property is kind of a nice one. And last for these first, this first set, substitution. We know substitution. You can replace one value with another. Hello, when I'm absent, I get a substitute, right? It's somebody who's replacing me as the teacher of the class. Of course, they'll never teach it as good as I can, but there is a replacement. We did substitution in the last section um, with evaluate, whoops, too many letters on that evaluate, evaluate 2x squared if x equals negative 3, that's substitution. We're substituting the negative 3 in there. We're doing the math. And we can do that in other um, contexts as well. Remember, when you square a negative 3, what sign? Squaring is always a positive experience. So negative 3 squared would be 9 times 2 would be 18. So double check and see if you get a positive 18 for that answer. Addition property and multiplication property. I told you there's a lot of properties. I'm sorry. It is what it is. These two guys are really easy, though. Additive identity says you can add zero and you keep your identity. You've heard of identity theft, right? Well, if we add zero, there is no identity theft happening. It's keeping the same value. Negative 2 plus zero is still negative 2. It's keeping its identity. So we're adding, but keeping the same identity. Additive inverse is kind of along the same lines. If you add the additive inverse, you get zero. So negative three plus some number will give us zero. What do we have to add to negative three in order to get a zero? So this is the additive Ident additive inverse, sorry. Got confused for a second. So the key to additive inverse is that your answer is equal to zero. Additive identity, your identity stays the same, you're adding zero. 
multiplicative identity. So if we're multiplying, how do we keep the same identity? We multiply by 1, right? So negative 2 times 1 is still negative 2. It keeps its identity. Doesn't change. Multiplicative property of 0 is my favorite. Some people get a little lazy and call it MPZ, multiplicative property of zero. It really just rolls right off the tongue. If you say it a few times, go ahead and say it. Multiplicative property of zero. What happens when you multiply by zero? You get zero. That's the multiplicative property of zero. These aren't that painful, right? Multiplicative inverse, you may have also heard the term. I tend to use reciprocal more frequently than multiplicative inverse. But multiplicative inverse or reciprocal is when you multiply by the multiplicative inverse, you get 1. Remember, additive inverse, we got 0. Multiplicative inverse, we get 1. So if I've got 3 fifths, times something and I want to get an answer of 1, what would that something be? 5 thirds, right? Because then if I did the math, I'd have 15 over 15, which gives me a positive 1. So what's the multiplicative inverse then? What could we multiply 2 by? 2 times something will give us 1. So what does this something have to be? So you have to think about what's 2 as a fraction. If I think about 2 as a 2 over 1, because that's the same thing, now you can see that multiplicative inverse, right? Or the reciprocal, that would be 1 over 2. You'd end up with a 2 over 2, which would give you a 1. That one was a 15 over 15. That makes sense to everybody. I'd, I'd be willing to bet you know reciprocal better than multiplicative inverse. So let's evaluate this. Let's just do this number one. We'll skip the next one so we can talk about it. Name the property used in each stem. So I've got 1 fourth multiplied by a 12 minus 8 plus 3 multiplied by a 15 minus 5 or 15 divided by 5 minus 2. So think PEMDAS. We're going to still use order of operations, but now we're going to stop whenever we do them. That's why I said, remember, you have to show your steps or your work along the way because that tells us we can stop and say what property is allowing us to do that. So first of all, if we're going to do this, we're going to start with parentheses or grouping symbols, right? So I've got a parenthesis or grouping symbol here, a parenthesis or grouping symbol here. Is everybody okay with taking care of all the parentheses or grouping symbols at one time? Excellent. So what's 12 minus 8? I'm going to just bring down that one-fourth that was out in front of that parenthesis. You can keep a parenthesis, or you can just uh, change it to a multiply. Then I've got that plus 3, and I've got an answer from inside here. We're going to follow order of operations. Um, we're going to do the division first. 15 divided by 5 is 3. Minus 2 gives us a 1 inside that parenthesis. Now here's the thing, when you're just doing a math problem and getting a random answer like four, zeros or ones are big clues for you, that property is substitution. We're doing the math and we're substituting the correct answer. So now if we think order of operations, we're actually going to split this into two because notice I've got a multiply, an add, and a multiply. So order of operations tells me I've got to do the multiplies first, right? Multiply here and a multiply by here. But these are two separate properties happening. So I've got a 1 fourth times 4. That is that last property we just talked about. Because if I made this 4 into a fraction, it would be 4 over 1. Multiply the tops, multiply the bottoms, I get 4 over 4. What's 4 over 4 simplify to become? That's a big old 1, right? That property is called either multiplicative inverse, or if you'd prefer to say reciprocal, pick one. You don't have to write them both. But I'm going to just bring this other stuff exactly identical because we haven't done that yet. 
So now I'm going to do this multiplying problem because I have to multiply before I can add. 3 times 1, we all know the answer to that. That's 3. But there is a special property when we do 3 times 1 and it stays a 3. It keeps the same identity. And what mathematical operation are we using? Multiplicative identity. If you just put MI, I don't know if it's inverse or identity. So you have to put identity down. And you have to tell me that it's multiplying, not adding. You need to know that, not me. Bring down the plus and the 1. I feel like there's only one step left. What is 1 plus 3? Is there anything special, any identities, any inverses, any zeros, ones, that kind of thing for the answer? Nothing, right? So our property is we just did the math and we substituted the answer for, for our final. A lot of people don't like this because it makes you stop. You need to stop. You're, we're just thinking about and analyzing what we're doing. And a lot of algebra this year is going to be analyzing what we're doing and taking a look and thinking. So you may need to think this year. Let's skip this guy, but be, please be aware we're going to do one, this and ones like it. And let's talk about our last two properties. These ones are easy once you get them straight. Commutative property says when you add or multiply, you can change the order. So, for example, 3 plus 2, how about 2 plus 3? Do we get the same answer either way? Did it matter what order we did that adding in? What about 6 times 5? What about 5 times 6? Did it matter what order? We still get a big old 30. So, commutative says we can change the order. Associative property says when you add or multiply, you can change the grouping symbols. Remember, grouping symbols are parentheses. So if we're going to do an example of um, that, we could say 2 plus 3 in parentheses plus 4, or 2 plus the 3 plus 4 in parentheses. What do you get either way? I'm looking at a 9 no matter which way I do that. How about a 2 times 3 in parentheses and multiply that by 4? That looks weird, right? Or 2 multiplied by 3 times 4? I'm thinking either way it goes. I get a 24 for that answer. We need to talk about, oh, so associative, you can change the grouping. So I remember coag. I know it's dumb, but it works for me every time. Coag. If you remember coag, commutative order, associative grouping. We did not talk about multiplying and dividing. I'm sorry. We did not talk about subtraction and dividing, and we will. We need to. So, um... We'll do that in class. Um, just a quick thing here. If I asked you to do this math problem three without a calculator, and I may ask you to do no calc problems, five times seven times four times two, well, I would immediately know five times seven is 35, but then timesing by four, and then I start to get too big, and then I'm not sure. So let's do something different. Let's put the 5 times 4 together. Actually, you know what? Let's even go different because I think it'll be easier. Let's put the 5 times 2 together because everybody knows 5 times 2, right? And then let's put these 7 times 4 together. What did I just change? The order or the grouping symbols? I just changed the order, right? So I'm going to use the commutative property to do this problem with no calculator. Because what's 5 times 2? What's 7 times 4? What's 10 times 28? Much easier than trying to do 35 times 4 times 2. That's 28 with an extra 0 at the end. So this would be substitution. And so would this last one. There we go. So, lesson summary. 
all you need to do is tell me what's the difference between the multiplicative identity and the additive identity. Identity is a key word, so you want to probably say what happens with that. And then multiplicative and additive would be helpful. And for practice problem, evaluate this. State the property used with each step. There will be two steps, so you'll have to tell me two properties. And you're going to follow order of operations. All right, that's it for section 1-3. Bring your questions to class. We'll talk about these. Um, these are going to be just a lot of thinking, remembering. Um, we'll do some stuff to help you with remembering these different properties. All right.